Uh, so yeah, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Denyer. Um, I'm a WSET educator um, and also a Carver educator as well. Um, I will be generally hosting this, um, this Carver event um, for you this afternoon. I am joined by panellists um, in the panel. Um, I'll get the, our panellists to introduce themselves. So we have um, Dr. Jamie Good, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, we have Roger Canals, um, who is a Carver producer. Um, from Vans Elsep, and we've also got Katerina Soares, um, who is from Huvean Camps. Um, so I'll just lend, I'll leave it to them to introduce themselves properly. So um, after you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Good. I'm a wine journalist, lecturer, and judge, and book author. Um, I've got lots of interests, but one of my interests is in sparkling wines, um, and I've recently. Um, become very interested in the, the revolutions that are happening in um, Carver, in Dio Carver. And I did a visit there fairly recently with a major tasting, visited lots of producers and came away really impressed. Thank you, um, Jamie. And Roger? Hello, uh, I'm Roger. Uh, I'm the export manager from Minzel Sep, but also I'm winemaker. I work uh, in, with the company also in different technical uh departments uh but uh finally we are a winery that we are small we are focused uh not with the quantity so normally more in the quality of our of our area so uh we had experience for more of 50 years and i think that we can explain a lot of things today also thank you and um, over to you katarina uh, hello, I'm Katerina. Uh, I work in the wine business for more than 15 years, so it makes me feel a bit old, but uh, <laughs> I have experience with, uh, with wines from all over the world. I work uh, here with Cava for some years now. Uh, Juve Camps has um, more than 200 years in the viticultural history. Actually, we are, we are neighbors from uh, the winer of uh, Roger, no, Canals. We're just Lovely. next to each other, actually two neighbors. So it's really uh, one of the best places to produce uh, premium covers as we both uh, do. Um, we focus a lot in the, the terroir and having the best expression uh, from, from the wines from, from this region. I think, well, Juve Camps is a very well-known brand and the well family owned. I'm also the WCT3 uh, certificate. Uh, so I hope I can well help you with any doubts you have today. Thank you. Thank you and um, thanks everyone. Um, so yeah, we'll get to learn a lot more about um, your wineries and, and, and those carvers that you produce as we go through um, this webinar. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we, um, we get going with that. So the format of this is I'm gonna do a little introduction um, on, on Dio Carver, um, look at some of the new, um, the, some of the changes that have been made quite recently. Um, and Dr. Jamie Good has been there very recently as well, so he knows exactly what's going on. Um, well, the up-to-date information, um, as will um, those that, that work there. So as we go through this, there will be some discussion, which I've got some outlines, some outline topics that we'll, um, we'll be mainly discussing. And then um, if those of you have any questions, um, you can pop them in the Q&A. So I will be um, looking at those questions in the Q&A as we go along. If it's relevant to answer them, then I will try and direct them to the right person or they'll be ended and they'll be, they'll be answered towards the end of this webinar. So um, just briefly a, a timeline. So I won't read all of this out, but we can see that um, we've got um, quite a history here with 1872 being a very key date. Um, so the first traditional method sparkling wines um, produced in what is kind of known as the sort of the birthplace of Carver, um, the San Sardoni da Noia. Um, and then moving on a few years, um, the grape varieties that, um, that are planted now are really um, established then following um, the issue of phylloxera, which in some ways um, sort of helped um, to create an identity within um, the, the Carver wines. Um, so 1959 is when the word was actually used to denote these wines, um, you know, meaning um, cellar, so where, where the wines are generally kept, where they're on the lees for that traditional um, method um, production. Um, and then the Consejo Regulador, 
um, they were um, they were set up. Um, so they're there to kind of monitor the quality and place those restrictions um, and regulations that are necessary to provide the quality um, that we expect from Carver. Um, we had the definition and limitations um, in 1986. Um, and then sort of more what we recognize of, um, of the regulations um, were more in, established in 1991. And then very recently, um, we've had some um, really helpful, I believe, um, um, plans to look at the segmentation, zoning, um, and, um, and the new labels and what they, what you, what we will see on our bottles to give us an idea of, uh, of the maturity of the wines, um, where they come from, et cetera. So we'll explore that in a little bit more detail and talk to the producers as well about how that's affected what they do or if it has at all. Um, so um, we can see that Carver actually um, over the last um, year or so has uh, increased um, in its sales. Um, so, you know, this is a big, you know, it, there's a lot of lot of producers, but there's also not just producers. Um, there are growers, there are people who produce the musts, the base wines, um, and then there's sort of, um, and then continuing on with that, we've got some that do everything, some that do part the, some things, and, and we'll look at what that means as well for the labelling terms. But, you know, huge amount of grapes produced, um, as we can see, and then um, almost, um, 250 million bottles um, that we've had for sales um, in from uh, 2022. So a really good increase of almost coming up to 5% so on, um, on 2021. So it's, we, you know, sparkling wine is a, is a growing market, um, but we have had quite a difficult time um, and to see that increase is really promising. So um, where, it's, where it's sold, so we've got... Um, Quite a, quite a lot is exported, I think coming up to almost around 70%. Um, the main countries being sort of USA, Germany, Belgium, and the United Kingdom, but we'll discuss a bit later where, um, where emerging markets are and um, other potential sales for Carver. Um, and um, we can see as well that they've got this, um, the category Garda Superior, which is a, a kind of a newly, um, sort of labelled category. This has been existing, but it's now more formally labelled. Um, that th those wines with more ageing and um, now made organically um, have grown quite significantly as well. So, um, so these are the labels that we will be starting to see more and more of on the backs of the bottles, um, and these are um, these are now really about the. Um, the aging requirements and what's really important and we will discuss further is organic practice. So um, you can see on this first label here, so this is um, a Carver de Garda. So Carver de Garda, so not superior yet, um, Carver de Garda, Garda, nine months minimum time um, on, on the, um, in, in the bottle there between the, um, the time of adding the, um, for the second fermentation un until disgorgement. Um, and you can also see actually on these labels that they've got a zone. So we've got Comptats to Barcelona. So we'll look at the zones in just a moment. So we've got a more specific place evident on the bottle. Uh, we've got the aging requirement on the bottle there as well. So that's for your, um, for your Carver de Garda. Um, now Carver de Garda Superior is now moving into longer aging and now from 2025, that has to be 100% organic um, in the vineyard. Um, so you can see that the minimum requirement for our reserva um, is, as and if you're familiar with the reserva term, it used to be less time than this. So the amount of months has gone up, um, which is the minimum requirement for aging on the lees, and that's now 18 months. Um, and then we've got the Grand Reserva, um, which is 30 months. So you can see that and you can see the different colours of the labels there. So this new, this category, the Carver de Garda Superior, we're looking at 100% organic in the vineyard, a maximum of 10,000 um, kilos per hectare of grapes. And um, so these are very closely regulated, these wines. We've also got a couple of other labels that we're going to be seeing more of on bottles as well. So we've got the Carver de Paraje. Um, so the Carver de Paraje is a single estate carver with a minimum of 36 months. 
on the leaves there. So that's even longer aging. And these are known for having more of a kind of a uniqueness, a real identity, and because obviously they're coming from a, a particular site. Um, and we've also got the Elaborado Integral. And the Elaborado Integral is when everything is done by that producer. So the whole carver production, um, you know, they, they've got, they've, um, they are pressing the grapes um, and they're vinifying and they're doing that on their own property. And both producers that we have today um, have both of those in their ranges. At the moment, it's for Carva de Paraje, there are around um, six producers producing Carva de Paraje and for the um, the Elaborado Integral that is 15. So these are not widely available generally as, as carvers. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to discover more about them and get to hopefully taste them as we um, generally learn more about, about carver and experience it more. So we've got some zones um, and we've got some more sort of official zones. We have, um, well, 95% of, uh, of Carver is generally from Penedes. So we're gonna have a huge proportion of, of producers around there. So we're looking at the uh, Comtats de Barcelona and within that in particular, um, the Valls de Noia Foire. Um, but then we've got other areas in Catalonia as well where um, the wine is being produced and these labels, these, these, um, these sort of subzones can, um, can be put onto the labels, but you will notice that the wider zones like Comptats de Barcelona will be on those labels. Um, we've got the Valle d'Ebro, which you can see, um, we've got two sort of subzones there, the Alta Ebro and the Valle de Cieso. Um, we've got down in the south, um, right down in the south, over to the um, southwest, we've got the Viñedos de Almendralejo, which um, is just one area there. So not much carver is produced there, but what's quite interesting is the fact that we have these diverse parts of Spain where this wine is, is coming from. So we'll discuss a little bit about that later. And then at the moment, um, we've got an, an area near Valencia, has been referred to as uh, the Zone de Levante, but um, that's not an official term for it. So that's still in discussion, um, I believe. So yeah, so we've got these, uh, these areas within Spain, but most of what we're going to be um, experiencing will probably be um, from the Comtats to Barcelona zone. Um, so these are the general things we're going to discuss um, this afternoon. And if you, I've noticed that there are some questions, I'll look at them in just a moment. Um, and if there's something that I know we're planning on discussing, then I won't push for it to be answered um, right away. And um, hopefully you'll get your answer as we go through. Um, otherwise, I'll be very happy to, to share those questions. Um, but yeah, we're going to be looking at the effects of the recent changes, um, this commitment to sustainability, because I do think it is quite unprecedented for a region or a body to sort of put in place that these organic practices, um, but we can have a further discussion on that and if there is other parts of the world where that's happening. Um, then um, the support for that within um, within the Carver um, community in terms of production um, and those working in the vineyards. And it seems that it has been growing. Organic production has been growing anyway. So we'll see if that's something that um, that is generally going to be the case. Um, talk a little bit about that in, in more detail, maybe about the stylistic differences around the, the Carver zoning. Um, and a little bit more about those two labeling terms that we haven't seen so much of that are fairly recent with the Carva de Paraje and the Elaborado Integral. And um, we've noticed that within the, the, um, the Reserva and Grand Reserva, we have quite long aging and Carva de Paraje as well and see if that is something that uh, um, is going to, um, a, a style um, that we, we can get to know a bit more about with reference to the aging um, of those wines. So um, I will hand over then um, to um, the panel, if that's OK. And um, of my first question is um, what changes um, and or adaptations have producers needed um, to make since the new zoning segmentation and labelling regulations came in? And I think that one is probably best for um, Roger and Katerina. Well, in my case, like in Jube Camps, we are 100% organic uh, for a long time now, so there was no change uh, in respect to that. 
at like 90% of our, only one product is not uh, Guarda Superior, which is a rosé. So all of them are Guarda Superior. So it, they would have to be organic, but we were already organic. Um, also, uh, our Reserva uh, white is more than 18 months. It was, uh, it's 24 months. Um, so we didn't have to do any change also in terms of winemaking. So we already fulfilled uh, the requirements. The things that we had to change were more about the labels and the text in the labels. So you can see um, in every case with the new labels when introduced, uh, you will see Cava and the, the subregion we're from. And then also in the text, we mentioned the region we are from. Well, uh, the noise. So for us, more or less, it's uh, it's this. I don't know if uh, Roger wants to add something. Yeah, no, in, in our case, it's similar because we were before uh, certificated by organic. Uh, finally, the good thing of that is that we can have all the information in one, in, just in one label. Uh, in our case, also, we don't make any uh, Guarda uh, white, uh, Cava, sorry, just uh, Guarda Superior. So also to can um, represent our, our Cavas uh, in general in the market. I think that is a little bit better for the positioning of our of our cavas in, in this case. And finally, cava. The thing is that is not the same. A cava make it in our area in Val de Noia Foge, uh, uh, because the climate that we have, the weather uh, is different than in other zones. And can 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 if we can have this in in the label? I think that is a, a good thing for us because I th we we. We hope that, uh, and we, we like a lot our, our region and we think that it's very special. So finally, if it's required to put in the in the label for us, uh, I th also I think that is better because Spain is, is big. That is true. <laughs> Spain yeah. is very big. Um, yeah, no. that's, that's really interesting, actually, to know that there are um, some styles that you don't make and others that actually you've been making like that anyway for, for quite some time. Um, so obviously it's going to affect um, different, different producers differently. Um, but um, in terms of, um, you know, how you have been practicing, I suppose, you know, and and what um, what your impressions are of of where you are based and maybe wider, but um, what is the commitment to st sustainability and and how does that work? And and maybe Jamie, you've got some views on that as well. I don't know if we should answer or Jamie. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, if you want, I can say something about us. Uh, commitment to sustainability is very important for us and I think for everyone and in all sectors uh, around. Uh, in terms of uh, Jube Camps, uh, organic viticulture is one part, but uh, not uh, not only. Uh, one thing that we focus a lot is in the terroir and as a, as a back objective is that's to, to have no change in the landscape, to preserve the landscape um, and, uh, and all the diversity, also the diversity in animals and plants there are. So um, some examples, that's more than 50% of the state is actually woods and it's not farms and it's integrated in the vineyards. It's not like wood is there and then the vineyards on the side. So all this integration is important. Um, the, the thing of being organic and don't use these um, uh, pesticides is also important to not alienate any uh, kind of animal or insects. Uh, so to have the less change in, in everything as, as we can. Um, we also do uh, regenerative viticulture. It's difficult for me to try, <laughs> but I think Jamie can say something about this uh, as well. We have vines from more than 80 years old, and we believe that vines can, can live forever. And if you do the respect for the plant, or for the cycle, uh, you can have really good uh, old uh, vineyards and good quality wines. Um, well. I think I, I would let them also say something about this. Yeah, I, I also want to add something. Uh, for us also, it's very important this part in the vineyards because 
finally we are uh we are ho that that finally at uh, the wine uh what we drink is is finally if we put pesticides or something in the in in the soil finally these pesticides or these chemicals will come to the grape after that you press you drink that uh when it's cava so it's very important work by organic and also not just for the people uh, just not just for the the customers also for the that pe that the people that works in for example i i, I always I, I always told that my grandfather uh that was working uh for more of 30 years working with chemicals every day in the vineyard is is the worst part for for, for him i think that is the the worst uh, generation of the history of the viticulture and i think that now if we can change that uh will be better for everyone and also in in our case for example we change it uh uh how we work now we are working in the winery just uh six uh to three pm uh to can use the solar the solar panels that we have in the winery and finally uh we work just we, we try to work uh, as is as as much as possible with just uh um natural energy no uh, and don't need to use any any other systems with the with the solar panels we are we are working very well and we can uh, get the winery uh, in perfect conditions and, and works finally with, with natural, natural energy. I'd add also that I think it's, it's fantastic that there's such an emphasis here on the vineyard um, and that this is being made official as part of the rules. And I think this is a, it's a people could say, well, is, it, is this, is organics the optimal way to farm all the time. I think that's a separate discussion. I think the main thing is that consumers are really tired of greenwashing. And so many sustainability schemes basically are greenwashing. So big companies get together and they form what looks like a scientifically derived sustainability scheme. But basically, it's just rubber stamping what they're already doing with a few little tweaks here and there. Um, but this is actually, you can't cheat with organics. You know, it's very clear what organic farming means. And it's also, you know, whereas consumers don't understand sustainability, they know what organics means. They're familiar with it. It's the one way of green farming that I think has a resonance with um, not just informed consumers, but non-informed consumers, because they're used to going to supermarkets and seeing organic vegetables. And so there's some sense of, of, um, you don't go into a supermarket and see sustainable vegetables. And it's something that has a resonance, I think, with, with consumers. So I think this is really encouraging. And I also love that you've mentioned um, regenerative approaches, because I think organics takes you most of the way in terms of regenerative farming. And then you can start thinking about how to introduce biodiversity into the vineyard. And once you've got other things growing in the vineyard, um, this is really important because they do what's called ecosystem services. When you've got an agro ecosystem that's working functionally, um, then that reduces the inputs that you have to do because that ecosystem kind of balances itself out. And the other point I'd mention is that, you know, obviously there's a big concern now about climate chaos and particularly the warming trends, the drier seasons, you know, the, the and when I was there in um, May in the vineyards, it hadn't rained for ages, you know, and some of the vines that just started growing. Um, we're really struggling. And, and I think what's um, organics plus, you know, biodiversity regenerative farming does is it increases the resilience of the vineyards. Because once you have other things growing in the vineyard, and especially over winter, if you have good cover crops growing, then you can, um, um, then you can do things like mulch them over the summer, you increase the organic material in the soil that increases the, in, the, the ability of the soil to retain water. Also having other things growing in the soil increases the ability of water to infiltrate the soil. So you've got this benefit there. And then if you manage to get your cover, I mean, it's obviously challenging when you've got a very dry summer, um, you don't want to compete too much with the vines for water. Um, but then if you can mulch or, or, um, uh, or roll the crops, uh, the cover crops, um, they can form a sort of a, a, a matting, a mulch matting, and then that protects the soils from um, really high temperatures because in the summer soil temperatures can get really high so all these things working together finding intelligent um, um, approaches to how to work the vineyards I think bodes really well not just for the sustainability of the vineyards but also for great quality and so I think it's fantastic that that um, the Guarda Superior is going fully organic um, it also gives you a brilliant um, talking point when you're talking about the region because no other region I know has done this 
yeah that's uh, that's something I, I wondered about um and just following on from that um Jamie you mentioned about sort of the consumer side of things and what's your take on um what it mean what sustainability means in the UK market and how important it is it I mean you mentioned that sustainability as a word to to sell things doesn't seem to be what we're using but um you know what what's what's your your view on that well, two things. First of all, I think if you can go to consumers and say, you know, if you see this label, Guada Superior, it means the farming has been all organic. That's a powerful message because it addresses two things. It addresses the green nature of the, the move, you know, the fact that it's it's making these vineyards sustainable, but also it's changing the dialogue about cover. Um, because many people might just have in the past may have associated, especially if they shop in supermarkets in the UK, Kava is often the cheapest traditional method sparkling wine you'll find. And bizarrely, Kava is often cheaper than Prosecco. Um, so it's this message that Kava isn't like a cheap substitute. It's not a wine you buy when you can't afford the others. This is a wine with its own characteristics, its own intrinsic value. And I think once you start having that sort of conversation with customers, then they start to think, ah, wait a minute, there's something happening here. Uh, maybe I was wrong in my perception of Kava. Maybe this is something we need to, to, to pay attention to. And I think that's a, that's a powerful message. So it's, it addresses both the green aspects, but also it's a conversation that, that changes the perception of the region. Yeah, thank you. No, that is a, it's a powerful message, I agree. And um, why, and I don't know, as we've not got a representative from the DO here, but um, what you might know about this, um, you know, why did the DO make this um, bold decision to move to organic production? And what do you think are the drivers behind it? I don't know for sure why they did it, but I'm assuming that with all these measures, you know, that, that we, you, you, you introduced so well at the beginning, which I think are really a very positive messages. This is, this is a quality region for sparkling wine and giving people these you know, obviously it will take time for these messages to sink through and some people won't ever get to to grips with them. But, um, but I think that it, this is a, something that, you know, is, is a suite of measures that that a change is changing the communication about Kava. And I think it's a it's, you know, fighting that old perception that this is, you know, cheap fizz. Um, it's, you know, everything about it is cutting costs, cutting corners. To, to saying, well, actually, this, this is quite serious. This is worthy of attention. Um, and um, these, are the, these are the clear messages we have on the bottle. And you know, if you want to know them, you can know them. It's all there, the information. It's very transparent. And so I think the motivation is simply to change people's, you know, it's the right thing to do, I think, to farm well. You look at the regions. And, well, I'm talking about the contacts to Barcelona now, obviously. I, I haven't been to the other, um, you know, and that's most of the vineyards. Um, the soils there are fantastic. This is a really good vineyard region. This is a good place to grow wine grapes. It's not like, you know, flatland potato fields. You know, this is proper vineyard soils. Um, so I think just, just emphasizing this and emphasizing the, the, the quality aspects, I think is really powerful. And, um... And I suppose this is probably more focused for, for you, Roger, um, Roger and Katerina, and probably you've um, sort of answered this before a little bit, but, you know, um, have the producers generally got behind this? And, um, you know, was this a welcome decision? Yeah. Roger, I don't know if you want to speak at the same time. Uh, I think this is, uh, well, you, you talk about the bold decision. For me, it's not so bold. Actually, it's natural and it could have been done actually um, before. As Roger was uh, saying, uh, they are also organic for a long time already. And it's, um, I think also different from other regions in the world, we have a lot of sun, it's quite dry environment. So it's not so difficult to do it ecologic actually. And it's uh, 
also this helps uh, to to have a more um identity profile of kava regarding other regions as jamie was saying it's just not the cheap option we have our own identity and being also organic uh, allows us to have a more um to express better also the terroir and um, and, and and the grapes and the soil the climate or the, the origin that we focus um, as well, so I think it's something that, uh, if you look as a especially mid-term and long-term decision, this is obvious. It's not something bold, or and I think everyone welcome in general. Yes, uh, I think exactly the same of Katarina. The good thing that we have here in our region is that the weather that we have is 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 good to do to the organic to work by organic. You have we have not a lot of frames uh also depend of the year because uh with the change of climate we are uh, getting all every time more difficult to can prevent the, the 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 weather of every year everything is changing for example in 2020 we had uh the double of the normal range that we have a normal year and for example in our case we lose it uh uh, the the sixty five percent of all the production that we had in in SPH so it was horrible so finally we need to speak about also the risk that is work by organic work by organic is not everything good every year but you you have risks but I think that that we need to accept this risk because I think that this is the right uh, way to go and and a normal year normally you have not these these problems okay and and finally for us uh, it's important. Uh, to to keep going with this mentality, and I think that for for Cava in the future will be will be amazing because I think that the weather is not going to have more rains in in general. So every year is more dry, so uh, work by organic and can control uh, with with without chemicals the vineyards with the knowledge that we have right now and the experience. Uh, we work more in the prevention in prevent than not uh, act. No, and finally, if we can prevent. Uh, a lot of things that can happen in the vineyards, we we don't need the chemicals. I, this, that's, that's my opinion. Especially if we're talking about uh, quality uh, wines, not focus on the volume, as also the, the wines also that with Roger uh, is talking. If you focus on the quality and not the volumes, uh, organic, uh, it's very important. If you have very uh, stressed about the volumes, I have to guarantee uh, to supply supermarkets big volumes is more difficult, I understand, uh, to do that. For us, it's not a problem, I think also for the No, thank you for that. And actually, I've got a follow-on question, um, which maybe you want, maybe have some anecdotal evidence of, but um, it's saying, has the Carver de Garda category been well-received? I think the Mingarda Superior um, has been well received by those producers that were not already farming organically, considering that they have until 2025 to transition. So is there anything that you know um, with regards to that? Any insights? Yeah, I think I just maintain my comment. I think if you are a producer that has a commitment with volumes with big supermarkets on a year basis, it will be more difficult for you uh to comply with this uh that would be my own comment i mean it has grown the organic farming and has definitely grown quite a lot anyway in the last few years so whether that is a response to knowing that these um there's going to be these requirements or just like you say you know it's um it is a part of the world where organic farming is um achievable and 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 it does it does mean that we have uh, it does lend itself to better quality um, generally anyway. Um, so another question, um, I think this is a I don't know if this is a question or a statement actually. So they're saying that um, Corpenat is hundred percent organic from when they started. Um, Classic Penedès is hundred percent organic. Um, by 2025, all Dio Penedès grapes have to be organic. Okay, um, it's now sixty percent certified organic. Is that um, is that the case? I think it's just the new labeling terms um, for some of the like the breakaway groups have all have always been more focused on um, on organic and from there um, 
their beginnings. Katarina, you look like you're talking, but I can't hear you. No, sorry, I was trying to understand the question. What is the question? I don't think it's a question. I think it's more of a statement. So, uh, as a statement. <laughs> um, but I mean, the thing is, like we've just mentioned, really, you know, there's been a lot of organic carver production. So it's just a way of, of formalizing it. Um, my general observations um, have, have been, um, I don't know if, uh, if I, anyone else wants to. I think to in the future, and in all regions around the world, we will have to be organic. It will not be something differentiated. It will be the, the way to go. I think, uh, as I think Roger was saying about his grandfather, the problem in, in the wine industry in, in terms of that is like uh, when, when exports were exploding, you no, know, in the 90s, where all the importers, they have to be a lot of volume. So they were using a lot of chemicals and that destroyed uh, what was, you know, a category of fine wine. Uh, but if you were, if you talk about always fine wine and things that we, we need to go to the other uh, and going back some steps and doing the, the, the right things. And I think the and we're, we're talking about a region that produces 250 million bottles a year. So, you know, um, I think great, great steps to look at a portion, a proportion of that um, in terms of, of moving towards um, organic farming. Um, so I think um, in terms of practical terms for, for the producers, what are the, um, the, the implications of that? Or have we, we think we've probably discussed most of this, but if there's anything else you wanted to add or Jamie, if you've got any views. Um, I think that the challenges of organics um, may be not so difficult in, a, in certainly in, in most of the vineyards I've seen because you've got reasonably wide road spacing um, you've got, um, you know, the, the really, the really time consuming tricky bit is actually in the vine row itself, you know, where the vines, um, and I think there's plenty of um, technology now for dealing with weeds in those zones. I think what I'd like to see is more discussion about how can producers keep more growth in the vineyard more of the time, because when it comes to farming, um, regeneratively or in a sensible, intelligent way, you don't want to have bare earth. Bare earth is horrible um, because um, it's when you've got nothing growing there, then you haven't got any, um, you know, you're not feeding this, the, the soil micro life with the exudates from the plant roots that are growing there. So plant roots generally give up to around 30 to 40 percent of their photosynthates back into the soil, because what they're doing is they're trying to feed those microbial communities, most specifically the mycorrhizal interactions, because what the mycorrhizae do is they increase the plant root zone um, by so much and they enable the, um, they enable the, the roots of the vines to find more um, mineral ions, they find more water, and they increase the roots, um, you know, exploration of the soil just massively. And so really what you, you want to do in terms of viticulture is organics is important, but then avoiding bare soil as much as you can. And I think one of the tendencies in many of these dry arid regions has been to overtill. I mean, you go to some regions and they've got bare soil even in the winter, which is a disaster. Um, there's no reason not to be growing stuff there over winter. Um, during the growing season, it's, it takes a particular sort of management if you want anything growing there when you're in a very arid zone where it doesn't rain much over the whole summer. But I think these sorts of discussions, I think, would be very interesting in any wine region. Um, I think um, the big advantage that um, um, these cover regions have is that um, there's a very low um, downy mildew pressure. And downy mildew is the, the, the tricky one to farm organically against because you need to use copper. There are basically no alternatives to using copper if you've got a high downy mildew pressure. And the last thing you want to be putting on your vines and your soils if you want to encourage soil life is copper because it's toxic to microbes. Um, so that's the challenge for damper regions. Um, but for the cover regions, low downy mildew pressure means that you need to use very little copper. Therefore, organics is actually quite sustainable. It's just a question of preserving that soil structure because overtilling also damages the soil structure as well as, um, um, you know, defeating the object of, you know, having things growing there because you, you, you oxidize the um, soil organic material when you turn the soil too much. I mean, it looks pretty, it looks really healthy to turn the soil, but it's really bad for the soil microbes. 
So I think that's the that's the the kind of the big challenge is finding the optimum, most sustainable way of farming. But as I said, organics gets you most of the way there. And it's so encouraging to see a region um, kind of focusing on that. And I hope that, um, you know, th and the other thing is I do think there'll be an upside in terms of grape quality um, where people switch to organics and that's only going to be good. Thank you. Um, I mean, I was asked, um, I had a question that I didn't read out, but was kind of asking a little bit about the stylistic um, the, well, the styles that, that are created. So it's quite a good point to kind of think about some of those now. And one of the things that um, people would have noticed that maybe they weren't so um, so knowledge about before is the fact that we do have these um, areas in Spain um, where we are where we're growing grapes for for carvers. Obviously, a lot of that in the contact of Barcelona, but we're looking down sort of around Valencia, um, around um, Ebro Valley, for example, um, and. You you may know um, more than I do. I've tasted a few of different carvers from different places, um, but you know what are these stylistic differences between the carvers in different zones? I mean, I can talk about my experience very briefly in that obviously different grapes are being grown in different zones. So, for example, a lot of Macabao um, is is grown in the other zones as well as Chardonnay in particular. Um, in the hotter parts, we're seeing uh, more Garnacha as well. So, of course, just the grape varieties themselves are going to impact um, the styles of the wines. Um, we know that in, um, in Catalonia, Charalo is a really, really valued grape variety, and that really gives those wines an identity um, from, uh, from the Contact de Barcelona. Um, but yeah, we've got a different stylistic dif we've got different stylistic differences, probably to do with a little bit the ripeness of the grapes, um, potentially the acidity there as well um, from different places. But um, from your own tasting or, or, or visiting regions, um, just throw this to all of the panel, What's, uh, what are your views? And is there something you can say about maybe your particular wine um, and the identities um, that they have? Well, I can't speak too, too um, um, deeply about this because I've tried a, a relatively small selection of wines from the other regions. But in the big blind tasting I did fairly recently, they came out really well. They, they looked really interesting. Um, but more generally, I think it's a really good thing to have the names of the places where the grapes were grown on the, on the label, even if it's too early for us to be able to say, well, that's going to mean it's going to taste a bit like this or taste a bit like that. I think it's just a, it's an extra level of detail, I think, that, that I think um, people will, you know, if they want to, they can find out more because the information is there. They don't need to know what all these different subregions do to the wines. And I think it, because this hasn't been labeled in that this way in the past in such a, so obviously, I don't think we've had a lot of discussion about that, but I think this is almost like providing a framework or a structure for these discussions to have in the future. Because one day it might be fun to get, you know, to get a, a tasting together with five examples from this zone, five examples from this zone, five examples from that zone. And suddenly then you can start having the discussion, even though, as we know, with traditional methods of sparkling wines, there are lots of things that affect the flavour uh, um, after the grapes have been picked. Yeah, and and with if we're thought, thinking about contacts to Barcelona and like the, the different um, sub um, sub zones you have there, you know how um, for for the for the producers here um, from Kat for Katarina and Roger, what are the differences that you notice within this within the this between the smaller um, sub zones? Uh, hello. Uh, well, thank you, Jamie, for uh, also. I think I agree totally what we said. I think that all the people who work with wine and the wine lovers, the beauty is the diversity. And um, I think these, even if the consumer doesn't understand exactly what is behind these labels, it's really nice that if they want, they can know a little bit more and help us when we're educating, saying something that people can, uh, you know, go and identify. I think especially this differentiation, you can see more when you go to a more premium, especially in Guarda Superior, 
uh, products when you actually want to have all these, um, uh, for instance, uh, we have one this like a single vineyard, no, Charello, you said about especially this zone of Comtal de Barcelona, Charello, it's known to be the noble grape and to give this particular style of this fresnel, very fresh aroma that you cannot identify in other traditional method. When I do blind tasting, it's always what I look for. But of course, if they are from other regions, I will not, you know, I cannot say it's a cava, but I will know it's cava from this region, this fresnel, very fresh, um, that the Japanese really love this usually when, when we have uh, tastings with them. I have this characteristic that is very um, identified, but especially uh, I think when you go from here with the wines and the single vineyards uh, uh, that you want to express actually the terroir and the region, this is particular more more evidence and um, and gives us uh, it's, yeah, it's diverse and different. Yeah, in, in our case, the same. And also just to add uh, the influence um, and the important for us of the local grapes, no? the Charello, Macabo, and Parellada. Finally, uh, the oldest vineyards that we have planted here are from these, these uh, three grapes. In our case, for example, we also we, we have some vineyards planted with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, uh, but it's around 10% of the total production that we have. And as you know, uh, the the first Pinot Noir and the first Pinot Chardonnay that was planted here in Spain uh, to make Cava was in the, was planted in the nineties or something like that. So we have the oldest vineyard that we can have in in our property is around thirty three years old, something something like that. So finally, uh, uh, oldest vineyard like one Charello, for example, of ninety years old, the expression that have this Charello is totally different uh, than a youngest vineyard, no. And finally, the identity of the of the region is for the grapes that we have. And for us, it's very important to work with, with the local grapes and, and to defend uh, a lot of these grapes because are, are more special and we can have, and we can make a, a most special products also. We will we will uh, speak about the Paraja also in the next uh, part of the of the meeting of today, but uh, for the Paraja, for example, we will just work with Cherlo Macabre and Paraja. So it's just the things that I, I want to add. Oh, from this question. Yeah, I think it leads on to uh, to the next question, which I was going to ask about um, sort of how important is it, because both of you have these in your in your portfolio, um, to have a Cava de Paraje Calificado um, in, in your range? For us, in, in our case, it's super important because finally, uh, the Paraja is not just a category, it's, it's, it's the vineyard, no? finally, it's the identification of the vineyard. The difference that, for example, have the the cava with the paraja qualificat of cava with the Grand Cru from France. The the Grand Cru is a area, a specific area from from the region, a, a special. Uh, but it's like different vineyards that are around this area. The paraja is just a qualification for a single vineyard for just a single, a uh, very small uh, area. In our case, we have the paraja Camprats. And finally, is the identification of, of this vineyard because in, for, in, in Camp Prats, we have different vineyards. Uh, for example, we have vineyards that are close from, from Camp Prats, uh, from, from the Paracha vineyards that uh, are was planted uh, before and, are, and are not the same than this. No? And finally, the Paracha means that the certification of this vineyard uh, that needs to be special, have a special terroir, special characteristics, not a lot of uh, quant uh, not, not a lot of uh, production. Uh, normally, it's, it's, it's practically nothing. We are making around 3,000 kilos per hectare in our paraja. And finally, we get a better acidity, better maturation, a more stable pH. And for us, is is the key to can identificate this special vineyard and, and can sail with a special category and that, that the people and the clients that wants to buy this bottle can know that this vineyard is special no? because it is not easy to, to get the paraja. You need to do a study. You need, finally, you need to do, you need two, three years or four to, to can get this if the vineyard is special. If it's not, you, you, you cannot have it. No? And, and finally, for us, uh, to have a product like this in our portfolio is very special. Right now, we are just 10 cavas, six wineries, but 10 products, I think, in total. So uh, to have one of of, of these products in 
from us in, in like para in, in the name of para Jeff for us is very important and it's very unique no and for the I, I think that the people needs to think like that that Aparaja is is a unique cava from a unique place with a special grapes also uh, in, in in the Paraja. so uh, to add something Roger, I think uh, that's the uh, what can really um, prove uh, what is called the Paraja is we are neighbors. Eh? Our vineyards are next to each other. And our, if you taste our Cava de Parajas, they have a total different style and a very unique style. So this is what Paraja means. It's really, I think it's for a consumer or for wine lover that they really enjoy uh, premium uh, bubbles, uh, sparkling wines, and they want something different. This will not be, uh, if they never tasted this, this sparkling wine, they can never know what is inside, not even for the label. It will be something different. It will be an experience. To make a Cava de Paraja, we're very proud to be one of these uh, six uh, producers that have this, because this means that we really have um, high quality viticulture and high standards in, uh, in winemaking. Also, uh, it means that uh, our um, winemaking team and viticulture, they know uh, very well the land for many years because to make these kind of wines, uh, you really need to, because they know what to expect you know, from each corner. Even this, our Cava de Paraja, it's from half of one vineyard in Bush and they know what to expect. So different style it's going to, to give to the wines. So for us, it's really nice to count in our portfolio and we're very proud to be one of the producers that can give something to, to the world and to the, to the wine lovers that it's going to be total different experience for anything they, can, they could taste before. I mean, it's great that I, I mean, I've, I've only managed to taste a couple and one, one was at, at your winery, um, Roger. Um, and it's the rarity of them is, is something beautiful, but also <laughs> we need there to be more at the same time um, so that there's more availability so that more people can can taste it because it is it's something else isn't it? it's another it's a really another unique level um, of, of carver so um, it's yeah from from my experience I've um, I, I think it's it's a great uh, um, a great thing to have as part of um, Carver Dio wines. And the other label that um, people may remember seeing um, is the um, the integral producer um, stamp. Um, so you've both got that as well. One of only sixteen producer, two, two of only sixteen producers to to have that. And so, how important uh, or what made you apply for that for that stamp? And what's the benefits of having that? Um, on your wines? Um, for me, this part is more important than, than Paraja because uh, to be a labor integral means that, that you are making and controlling all the process, okay? And you are making all the wines that you will finally produce as a cava. And, and it's, it's, it's um, a lot of importance because in our case, we don't, we don't understand the cava without the viticulture before. Uh, in our case, we don't buy any any grape from another viticulture because we have more vineyards uh, and more grapes than, than the grapes and vineyards that we need to make our cavas and our wines. So finally, uh, we have the possibility of, of control uh, all the steps in the vineyard. I can get the best quality in the vineyard, in the grapes, and finally can can always uh, find the best grapes and the most the, 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 the best quality grapes for to make our cavas and, and can control the steps because finally uh, if you have a, a, a year that for example the quality is not is not much is not quite good because uh, the weather or some or you had some problems a lot of rains mildew or something uh, maybe you lose more quantity but the years that the are good you you can you can know and you can control all the steps and finally when you buy the grapes it's difficult to can know exactly how it's going to be this this grape and and finally how is the quality and when you finally you don't know after you make it the wine 
So finally, we can control all the steps in the vineyard and always know the best vineyards to make every product that we that we that we make. So uh, to can put this in the label is important because it's not the, the it's not the same. Uh, make your wines that buy the wines to to make the cabas, no? Because finally, when you buy the when you buy the wines, you can do the blend. You it's not an easy thing to do the blend, but for me, the most important part is is, is make your prop your, your own wines, and with this with this stamp, finally uh, the, the 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 consumer can knows that we uh, finally finish the set, the cycle and and we we start in the vineyards and we finish in the bottle. And in France, for example, is like this: you, everything is regulated. And now, for example, in the trade fairs, it's more easy to to explain to the to the customers that we are uh, elaborate integrals because now we have this stamp before we had not no and finally we are different sorry we are different we are just uh, 15 right now of more of 300 producers i think that are making cava so we are special uh specials and and we can say it and and it's real because it's certificated and for us it's, it's very important very important one of the most important things that cava did in the last 10 years for us. Uh, hello. Um, well, of course, I, all, I agree with all that Roger says. I think um, it's a very important for us uh, because it helps us to explain how we do our wines uh, for the consumer and also even for, for our clients, for importers, for distributors. Uh, it's a matter of uh, credibility of the brand and also uh, it gives, um, uh, they, they can believe in the consistent of the products because of course, if we do everything ourselves, the consistent of our products will be, you know, uh, it's certified. Um, we are, as Rosé said, uh, 15 out of more than uh, 200 that produces the cava, but I think more than that, it's uh, differentiated as is in the international markets. No, it's not about just the cava producers. It's actually a certification uh, when we are uh, side by side uh, with other sparklings. They will know with this stamp, I think it's very important. And it's a good tool from, from the Biocava and a very good initiative that really helps uh, the, 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 the person who holds the bottle uh, to understand, ah, okay, so this, actually the person who made this, they control from A to Z all the production. And it will be always like this in the next vintage, next year. So it's a credibility and, and consistency, especially. So for us, we put it also, we communicate it. The only thing, I, if I have to say something bad about this, everything is good, is that the um, readability <laughs> of that is hard. And, you know, it could, I think we could improve on that. Even in Elaborador Integral, uh, the translation, no oh, in, integral producer. How do you, you know? For in, I don't know. It doesn't sound uh, easy in English. Uh, I think maybe we could work a little bit more. How could we communicate? I think the stamp is important. Maybe we could improve a little bit there on the logo and uh, in the stamp, the readability. Yeah, it doesn't roll off the tongue so easily, does it? And it's not very easy to translate and sound the same. <laughs> I do. I get where you're coming from um, with that. I think that's always going to be a slight consumer issue with um, with wines from uh, Carver Wines, because as well, we've got the place names, too, which I think we struggle with um, a little bit. But, you know, the quality is there. So uh, we, we, we'll, we'll keep buying. <laughs> um, and um, sorry, Jamie, did you want to mention something there? No, I think it's really important. I just love to see more producers doing it because I don't think people really I was quite shocked to find out there are 144 cover producers who just buy base wines and don't touch any grapes you know and I think that's I'm not saying you can't make good wines that way it's just you know the pressing stage is so important you know of, in terms of quality that you wouldn't want to live it leave it to someone else you know it's like um so I think that's a that's something that that surprised me so I'd like to see more producers using this and maybe they could just drop the elaborador and just call it integral because that's a kind of an easier, just the, a seal with a good logo with integral on it would be kind of cool, I think, just because then it would translate to other markets much more easily. 
Um, but I, I think that that's certainly a, a really valid cue towards quality. And I think that's what we need. And that's why I like all these new labels in the back, because they are, you know, if you're going to be um, Parahi Calificado, that's a massive cue towards quality. It's not just a, a box ticking exercise. It's like a, it's, it's you know, almost like a, br a, a brand within itself, you know, a collective brand that I think could be a guarantee of really very, you know, that you're going to get something that's quite special. And I think Integral could be like that sort of brand as well, a shared brand, um, which doesn't mean it's going to be per you know, always great, but it's it's just helping people find the bottles um, much more easily that they think they're going to enjoy and will pay a little bit more for. And that's the thing. And because with all these things, ultimately, if you want farmers to farm better, you've got to pay more for the grapes and you've got to sell the wines for more. And this is the, the, the you're bringing the whole region up. I think then enables everybody, every stage in the process to to be financially sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. And that's got to be the goal of all these changes is improving the financial stability of the region. And with that, um, paying a little bit more so farmers can do the right thing in the vineyards. And, you know, talking about quality, I think um, in the past, when we've thought about quality and, and Carver, we've probably thought more about aging and because there's a correlation here, clearly, isn't there, with our um, Aguada Superior and, and then the, the Paraje and those wines um, needing to have had more aging. Um, what, um, what do you think are the benefits for waiting longer before disgorging? Uh, one of the most important things and the most easy to can feel when you taste a cava is with the bubbles. No, uh, finally every year, every every month that pass, in the bottle every mo every month is more fine, more fine, and more integrated. So uh, the balance that have this sparkling in this case this cava is is totally different. Okay, finally also you have after the twenty four months you get um, in eighteen you can start having some aromas, but you get the autolysis. I don't know exactly is exactly the same translation in English, but finally it's, it can uh, apport all the sensation of the lees uh, that 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 have contact all this time with the with the cava. No, all these lees integrated in 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 the in the flavors of this cava. Uh, every every month that pass, it's gonna to be more complex. It's gonna to be uh, I think a little bit better with evolution. But I always say that it's important that you can make a, a long-aged cava, but you need to have a good uh, wine before. Because if the wine that you use, that the, the base wine to, to make the cava is not good and have not um, enough power, so you can understand, uh, finally, you can wait a lot of years that this cava is not going to be better. If, if you want to keep this bottle a lot of years, you need to have, first of all, a good, a good uh, base wine. And after that, the evolution is going to be uh, longer and, and better. But every always the aging depends on the quality of the of this base wine. Okay. So I think that normally this, this covers needs to come from also an old vineyard or a, a special vineyard to, to be made. Okay. And, and we, we trust a lot with the Grand Reserva Cava. And right now we, we are making more Grand Reserve Cava than Reserve, for example, and we don't we don't make uh, any any Guarda, no. So it's finally I think that everyone in have their style and 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 the type of product that 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 they want. So we we bet for this style of Cava. And we think that a special Cava needs to to be aged. Thank you. Uh, well, in Juve Camps, most of our portfolio is all Gran Reserva. Only four products out of like uh, more than 15 are not Gran Reserva. So it means more than 30 months. Um, basically, in a more simple way, uh, the two main things that the long aging gives to, to a sparkling wine is a more fine bubble, more integrated, like Roger said. So it will be um, less aggressive. No? If you find a non-traditional or the opposite of a soda, no? that you have all the bubbles there, if you give them time, I usually say that the bubbles, uh, non-traditional or, or just um, a, a normal, 
uh, a soda. Uh, they're like in the party, you know, all going around. And if you go to traditional method and you look at them, it looks like a fashion show of bubbles. They're all and with the right pace next to each other. It's just beautiful. For me, it's like watching, uh, you know, the fireplace. I just look at the bubbles. No, it's, uh, it's one of the things, not only in the mouth, but only in the visual part of the drink is also important you know, to have this. And it will be more fine. Also, it will give a more gastronomic profile. If the bubbles are more integrated and less aggressive, it will be much better to integrate with food. And we come to have all this uh, uh, gastronomic profile. We focus also in Blut Natur, Zilber Zil Dosage. Uh, also, another thing that, um, as uh, Roger is saying, okay, after 18 months is reserva, but it's actually in the 24 months that the autolysis notes uh, become more evident, even if they're very soft. Our Grand Reserva, uh, Reserva Pamela has more than 36, um, the brioche, the honey, but not only the aromas, but also the texture will be different. But as he was saying, you need a good uh, raw material, you need a good base wine. Uh, we do everything hand harvest. We do a lot of effort in the vineyard, in the viticulture. If you do all this, you will want that, that wine to show their best and they will show their best with more aging. No, you want your sons not to, to give to give more, to tell more stories. Uh, but of course you have to start from, um, from, from a good uh, base wine. Thank you. And we've only we're going over a little bit over time. We've only got a couple of questions left, um, just to to briefly go over. So just um, just to put those out there, um, and I think you've probably already answered this to a point. But how important is it for for you, Roger and Katerina, for the um, for the producers that, that you work for that you put the um, the zones where the wines are made on your on your labels? And what are the the zones that you do put on it? And, if in the case that you do, which I think you both do. Yeah, I think that I answered a little bit before, uh, but for us it's super important because the finally, you know that Cava, uh, we have different areas uh, and it's not the same, the, the terroir, the weather and the situation that we have here in Penedès that in Extremadura, that is in the suit of Spain. So finally, uh, to can identificate every cava and every style of cava, you need to know uh, from what is make it, no? And and before, fin finally, before if, without this, you never can know uh, exactly if this cava, the the the, uh, the grapes of this cava was from Extremadura, from Rakena, or from from Penedès. Now it's perfectly put it in the in the label, and for me this is is, is super important because. And it's, it's, it's totally different. It's totally different. If you can, if you compare with another region from the world, finally, normally the, the region identifies the style of the of the product, no? And here, because we have different diverse areas, we need to put it in the label. I know. I, I don't know exactly. I don't know if you have the statistic, but I know that I don't know. Maybe in the the Comtats of Barcelona is the ninety percent of all the production. I don't know exactly yeah, these numbers. I, I'm just saying, but. Finally, it's, it's not the same the cava from here that from another parts from Spain, and it's important to to have this in the in the label for us. Yeah, thank you. I think it's at ninety five percent. Yeah, yeah. I would, yeah. I would just add something that maybe was not said uh, because we talk about all the diversity of texture. For us, it's important also because well, me and Roger as well actually very similar in this uh, in very in a lot of points. Here in Penedes is where Cava was born, the history, the culture. So also this, um, also not only in the profile of the wines, but uh, it, it shows um, also uh, all the the the, his, the the methods, all the technology that was developed. It's is the origins of the Cava. I think it's the style that is the orange original, you know, from the origin of Cava and other regions are a different profile that uh, become uh, maybe in a later, uh, in a later phase. And so have different profile and the different history. But that was just would like to add is for us is important in school because we are in the core 
of, of the history of the cava and the main uh, um, well, uh, varieties, the, the technology, the techniques that develop the category of the cava. Great, thank you. Um, and just, just um, we, we've established the organic practice, but are either of you practicing anything um, biodam biodynamic um, currently? Yes, in our case, uh, we are working by organic. Uh, we make the first biodynamic cava, I think, of the world, because uh, we started the project in 2003. Uh, never, not never any 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 one cava uh, did some like similar than this in this period. So we start with the paraja Camprats, because we thought that was the most special uh, vineyard to do it. And in 2006, we finished the, the process and to, to get the vineyard as certificated as a biodynamic, and we make it the first bottle. So I think that in, 2000, in 2008 or nine we put it in the market. Uh, so now we are working around 15 hectares by biodynamic. You know that biodynamic is not an easy work because you need to do some specific works in the vineyard in, 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 in the right moments. You, you just can do it in the right moment. So uh, you, you, it's, it's difficult to do it in a big uh, property. Okay. In our case, finally, we, we decide to just work in the best vineyards that we have, the oldest vineyards that we thought that are most special because we know it. And, and the unique cover that we have to work with but by biodynamic two products right now, the, the, the Paraja Qualificat and, and another one. But also for, for the single steel wines that we are making in our winery, we have some that are biodynamic. But yes, it, I think that also is a good practice in the vineyards uh, because you you can you can be part of the of of the of the hair and, and and a lot of things, you no, know? and the energies that you have with the moon because the moon have a lot of influence to the to to our soil to to our energy and and yeah, that's we work by biodynamic. I don't know if Shube comes also have some vineyards by biodynamic. Roger, uh, finally we have something that we different. Huh? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as I was saying before, we don't have any biodynamic. Um, we really believe, and what I was saying before, and Jamie uh, was talking about, is the regenerative. It's difficult with the viticulture about all the 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 work that we do in the vineyards minimum intervention our objective and our chief viticulture is my favorite person in all the company He's so passionate about this and pep i think you maybe you know, lauren or jamie you met them um it's our objective that the the our estate would be uh, the same if we weren't farming no uh, we had other other plants, other animals, biodiversity friendly. We focus a lot on this preservation and ecosystem and having this balance. This is the important for us to have, of course, the good wines and at the same time having all this balance with all the landscape uh, that surrounds us. Thank you. It's very interesting um, to see the different practices, although fundamentally everyone's going towards the same, you guys in particular, uh, um, aiming for the same thing, and that's that quality. And so just to kind of round this off, and I have a, a question for, for Jamie, really, I think, again, this has partly been answered, but if anyone has anything they want to add to it, but, you know, so we, now we've got this, this category, this Garda um, Superior, 100% organic, um, do we think that this is going to contribute to category growth? The fact that we have this now, this this particular um, this this particular category, do you think it's going to? Um, do you think that that in category and and um, the sales of that are going to go up? But do you also think that maybe it will have an effect on the rest of the the do? I think it's a slow burn in some ways. This is this is thinking about the future. Um, immediately, it might cause the category to slow a little bit because in terms of the volume, because some people might say, well, going organic is just too hard for us. So maybe we'll release our carvers without doing carver quite a superior. But I think in the long term, I think it's going to have an effect on perception, but also an effect on quality. 
and I think you're sowing the seeds for then you'll reap the you'll reap the um the crop in maybe five to ten years. It it's always slow burn, I think, when you're doing something like this. It takes a while for the message to filter through. When you're dealing with a category traditional method sparkling, any changes take place now, it's going to be a few years before you see them on the market. So in that sense, you've got to hold your nerve and be patient. And I think it will result in category growth. But more to the point that the category growth, it will result in category strengthening. Because I guess this is a category, you don't just want it to grow in terms of volume, you want it to grow it in terms of value. And in some ways, growing in value is more important than growing in volume, because it makes it a more sustainable thing. Then you might lose some, if you're taking the category as a whole and, and raising the quality, it's going to result in wines that are slightly more expensive. You might lose some sales at the bottom end. But that's at the end of the market that really isn't helping anybody. The very cheap covers is it's damaging the brand. Um, and um, it's like it's almost like you want to lose some of that stuff. I mean, it's almost like a historical artifact. Um, you don't want people to be making distressed sales to supermarket buyers. And then it's their, their, their private label stuff. And it's horrible. And it's £4.99 or £5.99. That's an area of the category, I think, that has to has to kind of almost stop a little bit just for the benefit of the category as a whole. Yeah, I think Carver has has suffered from there being so much of that um, high sort of higher volume um, and you know less complex, not such great um, quality on on the market. And this is really hopefully going to give a good boost to um, to Carver as as a whole. And you know we have that more sort of halo effect. Um, in a way, particularly as we can now recognise that we've got a product that is not just quality, but also is is coming from a from a place, and um, we can recognise the provenance, and we can recognise the um, you know the work that goes in into this product as well. So um, I haven't got any further questions from our um, um, our um, our participants, but um, just if anyone wants to have any um, to learn anything more. Um, we've got the, the Carver Academy website um, where they've got lots of online courses you can do and just full of information um, as is the Carver DO website too. And if you do have any particular information that you would like, or um, maybe there are other ideas for webinars that you have, um, you can contact the real Rebecca Wilson on rwilson at uh, sofexa.com. Um, and um, it's uh, it's been our pleasure um, to, to talk about this today. Definitely has been mine. And I um, can't say thank you enough to, um, to Dr. Jamie Good, uh, Roger Canals and Katerina Soros for their participation today. It's been enlightening. Um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And, and we, we like to, to be here in events like this or webinars like this. So it's a pleasure for, for me and for Inselseb. And thank you to um, to Rebecca Atzapekta as well for helping put this um, all together. And um, yes, yeah, so hopefully we'll see you again um, for more more carbon information. And um, yeah, and, and if you are interested, which I'm sure you are, that's why you're here. See if you can go out and get some of these uh, um, these wines and and, and um, really enjoy them because uh, that's what it's all about, really. So yeah, thanks again to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. Thank you.